you have your Bibles tonight, um, we're going we're to have another lesson in Genesis. We've been kind of in and out of Genesis. We were there for a long time and we're sort of like in and out, but uh, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> And uh, we, the last time we studied from Genesis, we talked about Abraham's great test of faith. God did test Abraham to find if he was a faithful man. And if you read in chapter 22 and verse uh, 15, we'll just pick it up there. As Abraham was prepared, uh, as uh, God provided for him a uh, substitute, it says, The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. And he said, By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So we see, as I said, when we, when we looked at this passage a couple of weeks ago, this was a pivotal time in Abraham's life, a pivotal event, that even in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul used to demonstrate salvation by faith. Abraham is the ultimate example of what it means to have faith. Now, in verse 20 of that chapter, we have a parenthesis, but it's a very important parenthesis. Because God just promised Abraham that your son will be the father of many, many offspring. He'll have a great uh, progeny, I guess the word would be. Maybe it's the wrong word. Stars in the sky, sand on the seashore, that's innumerable. Now, in verse 20, it says this, And it came to pass after these things, that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she has borne children unto thy brother Nahor. Nahor, if you go all the way back to like chapter 12, when we first start reading about Abraham, he had a brother named Nahor. God called Abraham to go to the promised land. He didn't call Nahor. He was back where today would be uh, uh, Iraq, uh, the Ur of the Chaldees. And his firstborn, uh, he gives a genealogy here, and his firstborn, uh, or Huz, I'm sorry, Huz is firstborn, and Buzz, his brother, Huz and Buzz. <laughs> okay, the Nahor boys, okay. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. Um, and Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Kesed, and Hazo, and Pildash and Jidblop and Bethul. And Bethul begat Rebekah. Now, uh, out of all these names, again, whenever, whenever something like this comes up and a name is mentioned, it's, it means there's something important about that name, Rebekah. Bethul begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear and Nahor Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Ruma, she bore also Teba. I don't know why that was included, but there must be some reason. Anyway, okay. Rebecca. After, this, after Abraham <coughs> was obedient and his faith was manifested in his obedience, God pronounced, he restated his promise to him. He said, now that I have seen your obedience, I will bless you. In blessing, I will bless you. And he said, you will have, uh, you know, your children, your offspring will be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. Now again, this has been a promise that God made, from Ab made to Abraham from the very beginning of their, of their relationship with each other. But now it's, it's coming to fruit in, in, through the chapters in Genesis. And again, you can get on our website and most of the lessons up to this point are on their MP3s. Uh, you, you can see how God developed, how he, the narrative in Genesis develops it starts from creation and it, and it focuses down on one family and one man and his progeny and so forth. And we read the name Rebecca. Okay, now, chapter 23, we read that Sarah dies, passes away, and Abraham 
bought a, a, a tomb for her. We're going to skip over chapter 23, okay? Uh, not that it's not important, but it just, you know, right, we're just going to skip over it. We're going to go to chapter 24, all right? And I'm going to mention chapter 23 again, eventually, because everything we're reading here is the history of the beginning of the, of the children of Israel, and it's also prophetic. You know, God, whenever he, his scripture is so perfect that it could deal with the things that were happening then and the things that were going to happen thousands of years to come, okay? In chapter 24, and this is uh, the chapter we'll focus on here this, this evening. A bride for the sun. That's really what I would, if I was going to name this chapter or put a title on it, A Bride for the Sun. It says Abraham was old. Most say he was about 140 years old at this time. And he was well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham, in verse 2, said unto his eldest servant of his house, probably the same Eliezer that we read about earlier, that Abraham thought was going to be his inheritor before he had any children when Sarah, Sarai was barren. And Abraham said, you know, I don't have any kids. Eliezer, he must be the one. Well, this Eliezer is still with him. And Abraham said to him, uh, over the servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had. He'd been a faithful servant for years and years. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And somebody said, what does that mean? Well, I'm really not sure, but it must have been some kind of thing that they would do to make an oath to each other. Especially concerning this, because it's out of the loins come children, and, you know, put your hand under the thigh. It's almost to make an oath, okay? Uh, it's one of those parts of the Old Testament that we read, and we kind of scratch our head. And if, if you look in commentators, you get about 20 different opinions, and it really, it really doesn't matter. What it means is that this guy, he's going to make this, this, his servant take an oath to him. It says, I will make thee swear, in verse 3, by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth that you shall not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now what Abraham was doing, his wife had died, his wife had passed away. Now the time was that Isaac at this time was probably about 40 years old. Okay? So he wasn't, by our standards, a young man, but by their standards, when you live to be 150, 40 isn't that old. He says, my, my son Isaac is ready for a wife. He's ready for a bride. If he's going to be the father of many nations, he has to have a bride. He has to have a wife. He says, listen, when you're... He entrusted to his servant the finding of a wife for his son. And he, he gave him some conditions. He said, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and of the God of the earth, that you shall not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. That was the land of promise. He said, I don't want my son to have a wife from these people. Because Abraham understood the importance of this bride. That He understood the, the weight the, of the responsibility of providing a wife for his son that would be suitable of being the mother of the, the nation of the faithful. So he said, she can't come from the Canaanites. Now, a, a few weeks ago, we had a message where we talked about how in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there were women from other nations in that genealogy. Ruth was a Midianite. Uh, Rahab was a, was a Canaanite. So the, the, this isn't saying that, you know, uh, women from other nations could not enter in. But for this one, it, this was a special one. This was the important one. This is the fountainhead of what would be the nation that would bring forth the promised Messiah. So it couldn't be from somebody from the Canaanites. And I'm sure, and this is just my opinion, that I'm sure Isaac, being 40 years old, probably was looking around. You know. Probably was looking around and checking, you know. And seeing who was around, you know. Uh, and Abraham said, listen, I want you 
to find her a wife, not among the Canaanites, verse 4. But you shall go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. He's telling his servant, we're in chapter 24 of the book of Genesis. He's telling his servant to go back to where he came from, the land of Ur of the Chaldees, and that's where you'll find a wife for my son. That's where you'll find a bride. That's where you'll find a suitable woman to be the mother of the faithful. And not only that, but he said this. Verse 5. And the servant said, well, the servant said to Abraham, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? What if I, the servant's saying, what if I go there, and I, I go up to this woman and say, hey, there's this fellow named Isaac that's 500 miles away, and he, he wants you to be his, you know, you're supposed to be his wife, and the woman says, ah, uh, hey, I don't think so, you know, let's have a couple dates first, maybe, you know, anyhow. They didn't do that back then, by the way, we'll talk about that. But what if the woman doesn't want to go with me? Should I take, have Isaac come with me? Should I come back and get him and take him to, to that land so she could meet him? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son there again. He says, Don't take Isaac there. I don't want Isaac to go back there. If, if Isaac goes back there and he meets a woman back there, he might be tempted to stay. Listen to what he says. The Lord of God of, my, of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spoke unto me, and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and you shall take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son there again. And the servant put his hand under his thigh of Abraham and his master and swore to him. So he's saying, you know, if she doesn't want to come back with you, then I'm releasing you from your oath. But don't take my son there. This is his home, the land of Canaan. This is where Isaac is going to live. Okay. So he's sending his servant to get a bride for his son. See, I know, I know most of you are probably catching on. When we talk about the prophetic nature of this scripture, it's a picture of of what God is getting ready, of what God has been doing for 2,000 years, preparing a bride for His Son through the agency of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Let's just read the story. It's one of these, this would make a good chick flick, okay? If somebody went, you know what I mean. Okay. Oh, okay. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> and the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed... For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. Again, Mesopotamia, if you look at a map, would be the, the Tigris, Euphrates River, and so forth. Uh, the place where they say is the seat. They always call it the, the, the uh, Fertile Crescent, the seat of civilization. All right. Uh, he made his camels to kneel down without the city uh, by a well of water at the time of the e evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And listen to his prayer. Now, a lot of times people try to tell you how to pray. Do you know, it's okay to ask God to show you things. And, and it's not, some people say it's called laying out a fleece or something like that. You know, it's okay to do that sometimes. When you don't know, and when you're confused, and when you don't understand, it's okay sometimes to say a prayer like this. Listen to what Eliezer prayed. <laughs> He, say, he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. A lot of women coming out. That was, that was the time of day that they would come out and bring water. And let it come to pass, I say, Lord, if, if you could do this. Now, I dare you to say a prayer like this sometimes. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Lay down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that has appointed for thy servant Isaac. Now that's really a pretty specific thing. That's like saying, you know, let somebody walk around the corner in a Santa Claus outfit or something. You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, I mean this, he wasn't afraid to ask God some, a very specific, he said, God, I want to be sure I get the right one. Now I could say, oh God, Send somebody with like black hair. 
Well, anybody can have black hair. Oh, God, you know, send somebody uh, that's wearing, uh, wearing orange or something. You know, but he was, getting, he was saying, no, let her response. He was praying for a response. He said, when I go up to a woman, I say, can I have a drink? Well, most of the women in those days, being hospitable, would, would put their picture down and say, sure, you know, have a drink. It wasn't like today where they would, like, you know, want to see a bath or something. It was, they, they were hospitable. But not only, he didn't stop there. He said, let her be willing to water my camels, too. Well, you know what it would take to water camels? Camels drink a lot of water. <laughs> they got them big humps to fill up with water when they go, you know. So Eliezer was being very specific in his prayer. Do you know it's all right to do that with the Lord? I... Has God ever answered a specific prayer? He says prayer? about this damsel. Verse, look at verse 15. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold Rebekah. Remember Rebekah? We heard her name in chapter 22. Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor. So... Uh, Bethuel would have been Abraham's nephew, uh, and Rebekah would have been uh, Isaac's like second cousin. Okay, now son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. Verse 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. It's kind of a prerequisite. Okay, and a virgin, also a prerequisite. Neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And don't you know, she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, well, I'll get water for your camels, too. This is where the violins come in. <laughs> And she hastened and emptied her pitcher in, into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondered, I mean, Eliezer was like, wow, what an answer. And it came to pass, verse 22, as the camels had done drinking, the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels of weight of gold and said, whose daughter are you? I mean, Eliezer knew that this was the one because that was a very specific answer to his prayer. And when he said, Who, whose daughter are you? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. Eliezer must have been jumping right about now. She said, Moreover unto him, we have straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head. And what did he do? He worshipped the Lord. And he told her, he worshipped God. I mean, he came all this way, 500 miles. And God brought him to a specific place at a specific time, gave him by the power of his spirit the specific prayer to ask, and brought the right, just the right one that had been prepared at the right time. Man, God orders our steps in everything. See, this isn't just, just a, a love story. This is preparing the nation through whom the Messiah would come. It says, verse 26, A man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's uh, house these things. And Rebekah had her brother, and his name was what? Laban. How many people have heard that, that name Laban? If you know the word, you know the, the name Laban, you'll learn a lot more about him a few chapters later. Laban was a little bit of a rascal. We don't, we don't learn too much about him here. But we'll find out what he was like later, okay? His name comes up again. It came to pass when he saw the earrings and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard his, the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. Verse 32. 
And the man came unto the house. By the way, this is the longest chapter in Genesis, so we'll be here for a little while tonight. But and the man came unto the house, and he ungirded him his camels, and gave strong provender and so forth. Look at verse 33. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I'm, I'm not going to eat. I have something I want to say before we eat. This is more important. And he started by saying, I'm Abraham's servant. I'm here representing Abraham. And the Lord has blessed my master greatly, in verse 35. And he has become great, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and men servants and maidservants, camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him has he given all that he has. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. He's recounting what we've read already. But thou shalt go into my father's house to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow. And he said unto me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, verse 41. Uh, look verse 42. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper on my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. And he recounts the prayer that he said. And he recounts how God... Uh, answered his prayer. Okay, he, he says all these things. Uh, now look at, uh, drop down to verse um, 49. After he recounts everything that happened, he says, and now he's speaking to the, uh, the, the family. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered this thing, The thing proceeds from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife. Now, now you have to understand something. And again, it's really different. Whenever we read about these, these stories here in the Old Testament, they did not do things like we do them. We've talked about this before. You know, today, you know, you go out and you try to meet somebody and you date for a while. They didn't do it like that back then. When, when, when a couple got married, there was, there was a, a, a thing about, you know, I mean, they had, certainly had to, be, had to have some kind of agreement with each other, but it was more an arrangement. See, we, we think marriage is an emotional thing, and emotions are involved, and love is involved, and the commitment is involved, but it's more than that. It's a commitment. In, in the Jewish household, we talked about this before, if a man wanted to marry a woman, he wouldn't go to the woman. He would go to the woman's father. And he'd work out a deal with him. And the woman would have to approve, ultimately. She would have to either say yes or no. But the first contact, the first uh, covenant was with the father. And the reason... Is because when a woman got married, a family lost a worker. <laughs> you know, they had, they had to pay a dowry. They had, to, they had to pay the father. Because I'm losing a worker. So they had to remunerate him, okay? So it was, it was, it was, it was as much a, uh, an arrangement, a contract, as it was a love affair. And here's the thing. We're going to read this story... And basically, Rebecca said yes. She didn't even know what Isaac looked like. He could have been as ugly as a mud fence. She didn't know what he looked like. But the fact that he was Abraham's son, and the fact that God had ordered all these steps, uh, he, uh, uh, Eliezer recounted how God had ordered all his steps and brought him just to the exact right place. She wasn't like the second or third or fourth one to come along. The first one to come by was the one. They couldn't deny that this was the Lord. She couldn't deny that it was the Lord. So it says... Uh, verse uh, 52. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. The, the payoff. Okay? And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said... Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, 
Well, wait a minute. Why so soon? Stick around for a few days so we can have a few days with, you know, our daughter. And the servant said, I'm out of here. <laughs> I want to get her back. This is important. He's waiting. And they said, we'll call the damsel and inquire her mouth. And they called Rebecca in verse 58 and said unto her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah, and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. The promise. See, this you've got this promise all the way through. From Genesis to Revelation, there's this promise of God's blessing and God's protection and all these things. Now, verse 61, And Rebekah rose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Five hundred miles. That was a long way on camels. And Isaac said, from the, uh, uh, Isaac came from the well, Alaharoi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening time, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, here they come. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she came off her camel. For she said unto the servant, Who's that? And the servant said, It's Isaac. That's the one. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. She said, He's the one. Okay? And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and they married. And they consummated the marriage. And she became his wife, and he loved her. Never seen her before. Didn't know what she was like. Didn't know, didn't know what, her, what her little idiosyncrasies were. She just loved her because she knew that that was the one God provided for. Now, I'm sure they had to learn to live with each other. Because men and women is still men and women. <laughs> Ain't no different. But their love came first. Then the adjustments. So we, try to, we try to make it the other way around. We wanna, we'll get things right first. Now, if you decide to love each other first, then you'll make the adjustments, because love bears all things. He loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, beautiful story. Again, somebody ought to make a really good movie about this. It would make you cry. You know, it would. But there's more to this story. Chapters 22 and 23 and 24. See, God's Word covers all bases. It's prophetic. It's prophetic. In chapter 22, we read about Abraham who was willing to offer his son... And in these stories, when we, when we talk about typology, you heard, might have heard that word, typology. And the, the Old Testament is full of types and shadows of things to come. In, verse, in chapter 22, we read about how Abraham was willing to offer his only begotten son, his only son, the son of promise. He was willing to offer him on the altar of sacrifice. God stayed his hand and provided a substitute. In chapter 23, 23 we read about the death of Sarah and the burial, her burial place. And in chapter 24, we read about the father finding a bride for his son. Isaac type of Christ. We see Isaac awaiting union with his bride. Even as Christ is now awaiting the time when uh, he'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb, the union with his church. Isaac was promised before his coming. Christ was promised thousands of years all the way back in the book of Genesis. A Redeemer was promised. Isaac was born miraculously of a woman that was well past childbearing years. Christ was born of a virgin. Isaac appeared at the, point, at the appointed time, so did Christ. Isaac's name was given to him before he was born, so was Christ. 
He was offered as a sacrifice by His Father, so is Jesus. He was obedient unto death, so was Jesus. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was literally, uh, figuratively brought back from the dead, because He was as one dead. He was as good as dead. But God allowed Him to live. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And finally, Isaac became the head of a great nation. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaac is a type of Jesus in these, in these stories that we're reading here. Rebecca is the chaste bride. That's the church. She was preparing as a young woman, as a young virgin woman, she was preparing for a bridegroom. She didn't know who he was going to be, but she was getting ready. She was readying herself. Even as a church today, it says that God, uh, Christ is preparing a church without spot or wrinkle. Rebecca's marriage was planned long before she knew anything about it. <laughs> before the foundations of the earth. God provided a way for people to become the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. Rebecca was necessary for the accomplishment and completion of God's purpose. So the body of Christ today, we are here on this earth carrying out His will and His wishes. She was to share the glory of the Son even as the body of Christ is to share the glory of the Son. She learned of the Son through an emissary. Jesus said, I'm going away but I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And even as Eliezer went to, to find the bride and to prepare the bride and to bring her back, so the Holy Spirit is here today. And that's Jesus said, I'm sending you a comforter. He came on the day of Pentecost and baptized us in the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Ghost that we might be used as witnesses. And He is today preparing Himself a church, a body, a bride that will be presented to Christ. She immediately left all to go to him. Rebecca was willing to leave her home, leave her family, leave everything she knew. And she journeyed through the wilderness to meet her bridegroom. What a picture. And, and listen, we, we skipped over chapter 23. What happened in chapter 23? Sarah, what? Sarah died. Do you know that when the nation of Israel, when they beheld their, their Messiah, when they said crucify him, it says in God's word that God set aside his nation Israel. Sarah is representative of God's chosen earthly people who have not, he hasn't abandoned them, But he set him aside. And he's grafted us in. You see this picture. God doesn't do anything haphazardly. He shows us things. From the very beginning of his word, he showed us his plan for the ages. Thank God that the Holy Spirit is at work on the earth today, preparing a people, preparing a bride, preparing a body, that someday the trump is going to sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet Him in the air. And it says in the Revelation that there's going to come a time where we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're the bridegroom. He's preparing us now. I've never seen Jesus in the flesh. But when I see him, I'm going to know him. Rebecca never saw Isaac in the flesh, but as soon as she laid her eyes on him, she said, is that him? Won't it be something when we open up our eyes in glory and see our Savior? Huh? What a picture. What a picture of the son, of the father looking for a bride for his son. 
I thank God for His Holy Spirit. I thank God that I am a member of the body of Christ. I don't necessarily, you know, I didn't say I thank God I'm a member of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. <laughs> I don't mind that. That's all right. I thank God I'm a member of the body of Christ. And that I have a hope. That all the crazy stuff going on in the world today, you know what? It doesn't mean a hill of beans. Because I have a bridegroom that's waiting for me. You know, there's so many things that can make you get upset <laughs> if you watch TV. So many things that make you go, <laughs> and I'm beginning to find, I'm, I'm beginning to think to myself, you know, it really that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The stuff we see sometimes, it's, it's not right. That's all right. It doesn't matter. I got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land, I'll never, I'll never grow old. Miss Jane will never grow old. I, I'm waiting. Now, as we go on, and we're probably going to go on in Genesis, we're going to find out that Isaac and Rebecca, a lovely young couple, had two sons, twins, fraternal twins. They weren't identical. One's name was Esau. He was the tough guy. And the other one's name was Jacob. He was like the mama's boy. He was the younger one. Born a couple seconds later. Held on to Esau's foot. Coming out the womb. The natural way of thinking is, well, Esau was the one who was born first, so he must be the one who's going to be the... He's going to be the one. But how many people know that God does things... He doesn't do things according to our conventional thinking. Amen. If God did, did things the way I thought he should do them, we'd probably all be in big trouble. <laughs> there have been a couple of things I, I wanted to do, and God said no, and I'm glad he did. <laughs> okay, you know. We'll pick that up next time. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close?